I left Harvard, I went and worked uh, for a lot of big companies and got well versed in the commercial world and then felt like I was selling out and so I left that. And one of the things I did after I left that is started teaching design at SciArc. And this is a project that I did called Instant City with students at SciArc. It wasn't that long ago, it was a few years ago. But it actually illustrates, I think, this combination of infrastructure and economics to a degree as they result in a new type of community. At least that was our goal. And the idea of Instant City came, I stole it. I stole a lot of things. I stole, I stole Instant City from Archigram. I don't know if you know Archigram. They were very powerful uh, conceptual design firm out of the UK uh, in the 60s. In 1967, they had, had an idea called Instant City. And the idea was, let's create a little mobile urban condition that would travel to kind of dormant, quiet places and trigger vibrant urban activity. And in doing so, maybe leave behind this kind of bits and pieces of that urban feeling and trigger a city after, after this little mobile city was gone. That project was done in 1967, and in 2007, Burning Man happened. And I looked at this photograph, and I thought, God, like, Burning Man is like an instant city. We have instant cities now. I, they didn't have instant cities in 1967, but we actually have them now. So the premise of the studio, of the instant city studio, was let's look at uh, what happened in those 40 years and what's going on right now with an informal kind of urbanism, whether or not that's a temporary urbanism or a kind of quick urbanism or an in interstitial local culture urbanism. But let's see what happens when there are no architects around and there are no urban planners around and there are no people to tell you uh, what to do. Let's look at that. And then let's imagine as architects and designers and artists if we can intervene and, and actually uh, create frameworks for that interstitial urbanism to happen in a more structured way. Uh, I don't want to be left out of that equation. I love interstitial kind of urban grassroots stuff, but I'm someone that wants to design within that. So how can that happen? So if you look, and I don't want to spend too much time on Burning Man, you probably know about Burning Man, right? Has anybody been to Burning Man? Raise your hand if you've been to Burning Man. Wow, interesting. This could be like a West Coast thing. Raise your hand if you know what Burning Man is. Okay, good, we're cool. Okay, so you know what it is. Um, one of the things I love about Burning Man, just at an infrastructure level, is that they build a whole city out of just like tents and tarps and cars. It's actually fascinating what they get done at Burning Man. It's really like DIY in a genius way. They also don't have any money at Burning Man. You're, you're working entirely from a barter-based system. Everybody shows up in the desert for seven or eight days, 40 or 50,000 people. This is an extraordinarily difficult situation in terms of just infrastructure, like where's everybody go to the bathroom and where's the water come from and so on. It's stunning that they can get it done. Look at that, that's the plan, right? There's a structure there, you can tell by looking at it from above. They designed it, so it's not completely freeform. And I make an argument for infrastructure right here in this picture, right? There is a design here. But it's a design that is so light and so kind of delicate that it allows a radical amount of experiment to happen. Very interested in under design, not over design. Burning Man is a great example of that. Um, so there it is from above. I love this because they create cities, like I said, out of cars, right? So you see this happening where this is a kind of formal, semi private, group-oriented space that they've created out of just cars parked in a certain way and tents in the middle, right? This is kind of genius. You could, we in this room, if we felt like it, I promised I wouldn't do anything workshop-like and I wouldn't do anything interactive and I'm already starting to do it, but if the hundred of us in this room decided tomorrow to go out in a field in like, you know, ex-urban Pittsburgh and like start a little city with our cars and our tents and our pieces of tarp, we probably could do it. Um, there's another example. There's a few examples that are really seminal examples of this informal urbanism. The second one is at Quartzsite, Arizona, where so-called snowbirds, these are people who are retired, who live in RVs and have given up their houses entirely and live in mobile RVs 100% of the time, congregate for a couple of months in Arizona. 
uh, only for a couple of months. So if this photograph was taken, you know, two months before that, it would be just desert. And they do a similar thing, um, come together and create their own informal economies and communities and ways of living. Uh, doesn't this look like a solution to all of our something? Doesn't this look like some kind of solution? Somehow I look at these images and I think, we have all these problems to solve. Have, can we not solve some problems here with this kind of thing? You know, I think about this a lot. So anyway, that's a question I ask in a kind of open-ended way. Isn't there a solution brewing in this image somewhere? I think so. What I love about this image right here is how little use they have for design and architecture and anything that, or art, or anything that we do at all. <laughs> it's really not about that, but this is, a, this is a marketplace. They buy and sell things right here. And I always think, I want to design that. I, I think I would bring value as a designer to this situation right here, right? Wouldn't I? Like, they seem to be able to do it completely well by themselves, but I'm not sure. This is a question I ask myself. I look at this picture and I ask that. Um, the third case study, that I look at a lot is called Dignity Village in Portland, Oregon. I'm actually from Portland, Oregon, and I watched this kind of grow. I watched this as I was growing up. There's a very large homeless population in Portland, but they're also very proactive and cohesive. And they came together a while back and decided that rather than wait for someone to give them some housing or wait for someone to solve their own problems, that in fact they could come together in community and create a grassroots organized community, even if it was a homeless community, it was still a community that had its own kind of infrastructure. And when they agreed to do that, and they agreed to come together and they made that official, then they started creating infrastructure for per more permanent living. And you can tell this is very light infrastructure. It has its own interest for sure, but it's not permanent infrastructure. But what they did that was so genius right after this, and granted, Portland is a very progressive city, so this might have only been able to happen in Portland, but they went to the city and they said, just let us be here officially. Don't try and like get us out of the bridge we're living under. Just let us be here. Is it really that big of a deal? And the city said, okay, so they're here now, and it's okay. And they're asked to meet a certain level of code, and they have people come in and inspect this condition a little bit, just for safety, they don't tear things out. But they manage, the city manages this very lightly, and I would argue in a way that's necessary. And it seems to be a very nice model for a lot of different things that of course I'm talking about now, which have to do with infrastructure and economic systems, or in this case, regulated systems, and community, and how those three things can work together, especially in a grassroots proactive way. And truthfully, I like architecture like this. I like the pure form, I like the hexagonal, I like, I like this uh, stuff. It feels useful. Um, and let's not forget that people live in dense urban conditions globally, not as much in America, granted, but in other countries like Africa, uh, routinely live in denser, more informal, forms of urban community than we're used to. And we consider this second world and third world condition, and I consider it not necessarily third world, but arguably progressive in the same way that villages in India have economic underpinnings that are more progressive than our capitalist economic underpinning. So I look at these as case studies for things that could very well be just as progressive as things we have here, or perhaps more so. This is like such a stunning image, it just fascinates me. I don't think I'm a good enough designer to make that building right there. It's just like <gasps> magical. 